Welcome back, you here at Goldberg. Today we'll be talking about a very common plural leftist claim, which goes, mm, You ruined Africa! Now, this argument rests on so many contradictions, fallacies, and just illogical positions where it needs to be addressed. Many don't bother doing so because they don't care enough about the region in question, but Goldberg is in sync with life, the universe, and everything, so I have to. It's kind of my duty unto humanity and perhaps I will be rewarded at some point. So, there is no question if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, which, now, take a step back. Uh, you're saying sub like they're subhuman. No, no, you see sub as in geographically, it's beneath the... Uh, yeah, I don't care, screw it. Um, yes, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of climate, geography, resources, it definitely had the potential to become a global empire. No real, like, disagreement there. Uh, and in fact, there were some historical examples of African kingdoms and empires. You see them on the map here. Congo, Great Zimbabwe, uh, Katanga, Somalia, Ethiopia. I think there was also the Kingdom of the Kush. That's where Unde Chronic was born. But just because you have a kingdom or an empire does not mean that everyone else is, like, obligated to respect it and that it's going to somehow endure forever. No. You know, there's going to be internal problems, there'll be external threats. You have to expand out, meet others, learn about technologies, and it's still there, no guarantee. Of course, this creates a bit of a problem because leftists will say many of these kingdoms were technologically eons ahead of Europe and Asia. There was no comparison. But somehow this small group of northern barbarians managed to steamroll them very quickly, with the exception of the Zulu. So that doesn't quite add up. You're making an argument about superiority, but at the same time, one that is very paternalistic and condescending, like they were too primitive or childish to understand what was going on. And we'll get more into that in just a second. But I remember this guy, not an academic in this case, but when I lived in the city a couple of years ago in the gym, he starts going, Mali was the most impressive, amazing, richest kingdom on earth. And so the whites and the, 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 the Asians and the Arabs and the Jews all got together to make us slaves. I'm like, oh, okay, uh, I, it sounds like a George Lucas. Well, that sounds familiar. You know, we, we can diminish the effects of it. But with that being said, again, if you are superior, why are you allowing these people to take advantage of you? That's what doesn't make a lot of sense to me, unless you assume that, you know, there's some more, uh, you know, cloak and dagger nonsense going on. The related angle is when they'll say, you took all their resources, that's why they're not successful. Which, let's be real, the UK, if it had not expanded out from the island, would not be a great empire, would not have been able to create a great empire. But just because you have resources does not necessarily mean you're making use of them. In fact, uh, this is something, that, an observation that was made about some parts of Southern Africa. Now, maybe it was self-serving, but let's turn to our old friend here, Jared Taylor. <laughs> oh, sorry, I mean Jared Diamond, and this is a random uh, depopulation of frog person. But in any case, Jared Diamond had the whole guns, germs, and steel idea. He went to Papua New Guinea and said, If you had the same technology that we did, you would be a superpower too. This is laughable, because while if you look at South America, there were some impressive civilizations, and though not all South American groups were party to it, um, same thing with Central America. But in the modern-day United States, despite having tons of resources, decent climate for growing food, these Indians that have been there, as were claimed for thousands of years, had not advanced that much in terms of technology or way of life. It's been observed that the, uh, the tools they used were pretty much unchanged from the last you know, several hundred years by the time the Europeans had arrived. And even when they were introduced to muskets and then later on rifles, pistols, they would use it until they ran out of ammunition, but very few were interested in becoming a marksman or proficient or understanding the mechanism, taking care of the gun. So you can have resources. You can even have exposure to it. But if you feel like our culture is fine, our way of life is perfect, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to develop in advance. So that's the problem with claiming, well, if they had had the resources, they necessarily would have uh, become successful. They might have if they'd learned how to use it, but if they were just, okay, our way of life is fine, the likelihood is not much would have changed. And, you know, 
it's like saying you have to wait until they magically come up with it or you have to just show them how to use it and then walk away. That's not how the world works. Power and greed is a big motivating factor. You're not going to make a bunch of investments in going and trying to conquer a native land if you're not going to make a return of sorts, at least the private sector, which is a lot of what the UK used. It was you know, public-private partnerships and whatnot. Then we get to the argument that goes, well, the way that you redrew the lines of these arbitrary countries, that's why these incompatible ethnic groups fight each other. Oh, that sounds familiar. It's amazing how the ones that keep saying diversity is our strength, everyone should be combined together because they'll be more peaceful, at the same time will blame Europeans for introducing diversity to Africa? It doesn't really follow logically. By the way, if you're this advanced uh, set of empires and kingdoms that's so far above what you see in other parts of the world, why would you revert to primitivism in this rapid manner? Are, are you saying that they weren't progressive enough to realize that it doesn't matter if you're part of this ethnic group or that one? And mind you, it's not something that is just, oh, it was back then. In fact, with Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan. He lost the election to the Buhari guy. The Buhari guy is affiliated or actually part of the Fulani ethnic group, which they're into herding. So they herd their cattle onto people's property, like farmers, and there's conflicts. The Fulani people murder farmers if the farmers create a problem, well, the president has been accused of covering it up because he's protecting his own ethnic interests. That's an example of an ethnic group which specializes in a certain, you know, uh, mode of economic existence, and it comes into conflict with others because not all people are the same. They don't live the same lives. They don't do the same jobs. So, no, it's not just the European influence that causes this. People have their, kind of like the Indians. The Indians in the United States, in many cases, did not respect if you put up a fence. They didn't respect uh, property lines or boundary lines. So naturally, you're going to have some kind of conflict. Whether it's one way of living is better than the other, I'm not interested in that debate. We're talking about where the conflicts stem from. The hallmark in this regard is the whole Hutu Tutsi conflict. And they'll say, until the Belgians came, they were all at peace with one another. This is such a tremendous lie. In fact, I've seen leftists write books where one paragraph they say, there was no problem until the Belgians came. The very next paragraph they'll go, well, I mean, they lived different lives and came into conflict before the Europeans were there. Okay. So maybe the Belgians sharpen the differences, although even that is hard to make an argument for. Historically, the Tutsis and the Hutus had a really different way of living. Hutus, generally speaking, were not the most, uh, not the wealthiest as far as that economic system was concerned. They were more of like the general laborers. But it's not true, as a lot of leftists will tell you, that you see the Tutsis were all like really a lighter tone, and so the Europeans were comfortable with them. You'll see Tutsis that are very dark. You'll see Tutsis that are short, even though... One of the things the Hutus did during the genocide is they would actually cut off the legs of Tutsis because they wanted to feel like they were the same height because Hutus generally, not all, were a little bit shorter. Um, and that's a brutal height pill, by the way. But Hotel Rwanda is a massive propaganda piece. You know, Nick Nolte, they, when he's a little bit less alcoholic, you're worse than being black. You're African. And they, like, separate the white and black nuns, and the blacks have to stay and get killed. Like, that stuff's a bunch of freaking Hollywood schlock, to be perfectly honest, if you actually read into the conflict. It was horrible. But again, why would these people, who supposedly have been in peace and harmony for years, and have some kind of oral or written traditions, perhaps, about their history, in a matter of a short period go from, we're all, you know, peaceful and happy, to we're going to go and start cutting you up in the streets? Is that the result of just the Europeans, or was this maybe something else that was a lot uh, deeper and going back for many years? By the way, I should note, Europe is no exception to this. This is a global phenomenon. So the UK had the Roman invasion, you had the Normans, the Saxons, uh, they had to deal with eventually Scotland, Ireland. That did not end even until, the, what, actually the 60s or 70s? Or, no, the, the peace agreement was actually the late 90s, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, even though, roughly speaking, between an Irish person and an English person, 
They're not all that different uh, in appearance. Some will be, but there was still that conflict. You look at Austria-Hungary, which was this empire trying to meld a bunch of different ethnicities, linguistic groups, um, cultures, religions, and when that fell apart, you had in uh, you know in the, sort of the the shambles. You get Yugoslavia in one part. That was another attempt to bring the Slavs together, but still different religions, different languages, different ethnicities. And it was dominated by Serbs. In the 20s, they tried to write the constitution. They didn't really include the Croats or the Croats. The Croats were very pissed off. Some Croats believed they weren't even Slavs, that they were Aryans. And uh, that, of course, many Croats are Roman Catholic versus the Serbs being Orthodox. So when you had this nominal independent state of Croatia in the 40s, some of the Croats went crazy, to be perfectly honest. And they did a lot of what you saw in Rwanda, the Hutus to the Tutsis, they did a lot of that to not just Serbs, but if you were Orthodox in general. The point being, it is not something where the Europeans just introduced this. It is still going on. Ethiopia and Eritrea, and Ethiopia and Somalia. These people, you really did a study they're, you know, as far as their ethnic origin, they're not that far apart, but they're still fighting, whether it's a difference of religion, territory, or resources. So ethnic conflict is here. It's probably going to be here until the world starts just, you know, burst into fire. I'm just saying. It's not a good thing. You try to diminish it, but it's a reality. We also have to contend with the claim that the reason Africa is screwed up is because of U.S. or British involvement uh, to fight communism. And I've noticed this, white leftists to this day have this obsessive fixation and hatred for Dr. Zavimbi in Angola. They say, one source claimed, oh, the half a million people who died in Angola, most of it was Zavimbi's fault. Right, not the communist government that has like control over a lot of the military and whatnot and gets Soviet support. No, no, it's Dr. Zavimbi. The reason I believe they hate Zavimbi so much is because he was highly educated, unabashedly African, and actually opposed to communism. I believe he was more anti-communist. Like, Mobuto said he was anti-communist, but Mobuto was really just about himself and his own money. But leftists don't like that. They don't like a guy who's like, look, this is me. You can't say he's not like a low IQ Charles Taylor who's just into violence. He was a very intelligent guy. Um, it was a terrible war, right? But... The fact that we tried to prevent states from going communist in Africa means that, oh, yeah, you know, it's the, your fault for preventing. Why? You think that communist regimes? Look at Somalia. Somalia had a communist regime for 40 or 50 years, and they made pretty much no investment in the people, no investment in development or anything. So just because you say you're about equality and everyone rise up does not mean it's the case. In fact, in Angola, the president who just recently left office a few years ago, he was one of the big uh, big shots in the MPLA. He, I think, is a billionaire, right? A Marxist billionaire. Goes to show what happens. But uh, yeah, the fact that we intervened, the fact that we supported resistance movements does not mean that we screwed up Africa. That's a bunch of nonsense. Um, there are even people who have said that they, Africans, or Rhodesians who said, or black Rhodesians who said they preferred Ian Smith to Robert Mugabe. And as I've said in the other video, if there had been more of a, okay, let's take the system, not destroy it all, but try to use it towards our own benefit. Let's start investing more in children, education, fighting, you know, disease. That would be a fantastic thing and Africa would be much better off. But a lot of African elites are just trying to play the game of the one percenters in the West and the globalists. Just make a lot of money, live in luxury, and everyone else can just screw themselves. In line with that, however, it is important to understand that a lot of modern African states are basically slaves to international banking, as many of their countries are finding themselves to be. So that should be a centerpiece. Not more racism, more colonialism, but IMF, the big banks, the contingencies and requirements they attach to when giving loans, which oftentimes restrict uh, that investment to certain projects and do not allow enough to go towards stuff, like I said, education and healthcare, those things should change. Uh, but that's both sides. Again, that's the international elites that have to be dealt with, but it's also the African elites who need to 
recognize if they actually want their countries to do better, they're going to have to be serious about, look, you cannot take all the money for yourself. You have to distribute it and you have to have accountability for it. Uh, that would make them much better off as time goes on. I should note, as far as uh, China is expanding into Africa rapidly, the United States should be smart. We could probably, already with our connection with Liberia, we could probably start creating something of a regional power. And weirdly enough, some of these people who feel like, you know, in the United States, they're not safe, they're always being persecuted and discriminated against. Imagine if we actually made a, a legitimate effort to create a powerful, independent country in Africa that would be closely allied with us, some of those folks might feel more comfortable being there. They say, okay, I don't have to feel as though I'm being discriminated against. So it's actually a, a very smart idea. My point is, Africa is not screwed up just because of European colonialism. There are some aspects that weren't beneficial, but you can't deny history. You can't deny the realities of human development and evolution and ethnic conflict. It's not that simple. But moving forward, when you have that context, you can have a much better idea of what needs to be done and in what stages and how it may be mutually beneficial if you learn from the mistakes of the past.